So a number of months back, we were contacted about making a talk today and, and all of that. And we thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity, a great situation that we can actually present. And then two weeks ago, we get a call. And they said, we've got a great slot for you. It's an hour and 40 minutes into the talk. Everyone will have been sat for that hour and 40 minutes. Before that, Brian will have come up and give me every possible stat about mobility and everything that's going on and every trend in the market. Then arguably, the most innovative car company in the world will come up and tell you everything you need to know about automobiles and cars and hardware and all of that. And then we'll bring two panels up of experts and they're going to talk about technologies and everything that's happening. And, and then you just get up there and talk about whatever you want. What's left? So uh, there is something unique about the heritage of Panasonic. We're almost a 100-year company. And the entire existence that we've had has been based on the consumer. And it's not something that's easy to deal with. And it's not something that necessarily the mobility and the automotive business really truly understands yet. And, and let me give you a, a quick example. The consumer electronics business is almost entirely built on really quick product life cycles, six, 12 month cycles. And does anybody fully realize why that is? It isn't because we want to do that. It doesn't like we want to turn our product every 12 months. It's simply because we make a lot of mistakes. And we've got to correct those as fast as we can. And we can't wait three or four years of a cycle to be able to correct those mistakes. Because what we know is the consumer is very finicky. And he's really hard to deal with. And he changes his mind. And you can't work in cycles that are that long. So I think the automotive business is going to go through some of that learning as we evolve in this very disruptive way. So the consumer electronics space has been disrupted for a long period of time. We know a little bit about disruption. We've, we've learned some really difficult and hard lessons. So I'm going to share a little bit about that experience with you today and what we're doing in the automotive space to try to help enable those things as we move forward. The other thing is we know a little bit about consumer behavior. And we know that consumers like stories. We also know that consumers typically like to go to the end of the story first. So instead of telling you all about the technologies we're working on and all the trends and all that, I'm going to go to the end of the story, give you a, an idea of what it looks like. Fast forward from 2017, forward to 2030, giving you an idea how the story ends, and then work you back to the things that we need to do. So really, one of the stories starts in Houston, which is no doubt the carbon energy capital of the world today. And, and it's really a story about two elderly people just past their 86th birthday and a phenomenon that they're not comfortable with, the fact that they no longer own a car. But they're very, very familiar now with the fact that they don't need to own a car because when they need a ride, they just summon it and ride share is a reality. And on top of that, delivery systems come to your house so there's no need to go to the grocery store. Or maybe we should talk about Beijing a little bit. And, and a picture of Ming Yu sitting in a car on her way to school with her mother, sitting on a lap, looking up at the blue sky with the clouds and saying all the different depictions of what those clouds look like in the Beijing sky. But it wasn't that long ago that there was so much pollution and smog in that city that you couldn't even see clear to it. And even more, it wasn't that long ago when the mother had to actually pay attention to the road before electric autonomous was mainstream in China. And then there's Denver, one of the most progressive cities in the United States today. And how do they stay very progressive as we move forward? They've invested heavily in the things that the consumer wants, including intermodal, multimodal transportation that allows what used to be space that was reserved for an incredible amount of unused assets, cars parked on the street, and open that up to new opportunities with an amazing amount of bike trails. And then my final story really revolves around Munich. And this is Mark, who's taking the family up to the Alps for a weekend trip. And to do that, he's summoned an autonomous vehicle, gotten himself and his family in that vehicle, and instead of that being a treacherous ride when you're constantly hearing, when are we going to be there, it's now turned into a quality point in their life where they can play games, operate, and do the things that you would do in your home on the drive. 
you no longer need to wait to the end of that destination to start enjoying that journey. You can do that from the beginning. So I share those stories with you really particularly because it gives you an idea of what we believe the future will hold and that the consumer very specifically is going to make the decisions that will impact what we have to do as an industry. So an aging population that has a need for mobility, a highly polluted city that really needs for health reasons to clean it up, a highly motivated millennial spirited city that wants to grow, has to enable its consumer, and eventually time is our biggest limitation. So if we can add to the quality of life by increasing the amount of time that we can actually spend with our families doing the things we want to do, it significantly enhances life and society as we know it today. So for those reasons, we're absolutely convinced that all of what was talked about today is going to happen. It's just a matter of how quickly it's going to happen, at what speed it's going to happen, and what does the consumer actually say and do to actually create the value that goes forward. So I want to talk similarly about the same macro, electronic, or mac macro technology trends that many others have talked about today, but I want to give it to you from a perspective that's a little bit different, and that is of the consumer and what we know about consumer behavior and what you guys should expect and what the partners in the industry should expect that's going to come out of the consumer. So the first trend, I think you, you very well know it. It's been talked about all morning. It's talked about this whole idea of mobility services, car, uh, uh, ride sharing, cars as a service, all of those things have been talked about. But what we will tell you is this is highly desired. The penetration today is in the low single digits. We believe that by 2025, as much as 15 to 20 percent of all global passenger miles could be put through ride share for the simple reason the consumer will understand the three things that they are really interested in and that we have 100 years of experience knowing. If you can provide something that's faster and better and cheaper, the consumer will buy. And we believe that as you move forward with these services, they provide all three. They're faster, they're better, and they're cheaper. That assures us that that model is going to be successful. The other trend that we were talking about uh, earlier is this whole idea of electrification and will it, will it not happen and, and, and what is it going to happen to what extent. So the things that we've learned from our experience is we've spent roughly a billion dollars trying to be an eco, eco company, ecologically very progressive and all of that. We had this idea back in 2010. We spent a tremendous amount of time and energy and we found out one very important thing. The ecology, especially in the U.S., is not a differentiator. It's an enabler. If all things are created equal and you can be green at the same time, the consumer will buy. We think that's coming. We think that's coming as soon as 2022 when you start to see parity between an electric vehicle and a combustion engine vehicle. And at that point, the adoption will exponentially increase because it's no longer I have to make compromises for an electric vehicle. I get everything I wanted as a consumer, and that's what's going to drive behavior. The third piece, and, and, and probably the piece that's nearest to us today, it's already been talked about, this whole idea of conductivity and what it enables us. It enables all the things that happen around us, but what it really enables is what the consumer really wants, mass personalization. If you look at the history of consumer electronics and the consumer products, what really makes a difference is when you can personalize that product for them such that the consumer feels like they've gotten something new. And once it becomes personal, once it becomes uh, in, less complex, that's when you see incredible increases in adoption. So we believe con con connectivity to a great extent is an enabler for the car maker. We believe it's also an enabler in many ways that the consumer doesn't even understand today. We believe there's 40% gains when you actually connect and pull into a smart highway in the efficiency and the traffic patterns in cities. And more importantly, as we've talked about this morning, there's incredible advantages in safety once conductivity and a smart highway is put together. Finally, autonomous driving. 
There's not much more I can say about that other than the fact that we're absolutely committed to it as a company. We know what's going to happen. It's another thing that we believe, regardless of the surveys and regardless how many people you ask, at the end of the day, the consumer wants that because it enables them to do something different with their time, and we believe time is critically important, regardless what the survey data says. People will always tell you they don't have enough time. And if you can give them back time, the consumer will buy. So we believe by 2030, at least 15% of new vehicles that go on the road will be autonomous. And it may not seem like a big percentage, but at the current rate, that means it's going to be over 15 million vehicles being put on the road by 2030. That's an incredible number. And then do the multiple of 15 million times the amount of time that you are behind the wheel versus the time you're getting back. And I would tell you that there's no question this is going to happen. It's just a matter of when. It doesn't matter if they're giving up driving or they're enjoying driving or what it is. It's more about people's time and the value they put on time. And if they value the time behind the wheel, they'll spend the time there. But if they need that time back, they absolutely will use it. So technology is an enabler to get the consumer something that they desperately want. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, you know, that I didn't want to go backwards. But you're probably asking yourself, you know, Panasonic, consumer electronics, those are interesting stories, but what do we really know about automotive and what do we really know about this industry? We've actually spent almost 60 years in this industry, but it isn't until the last 10 or so that we've really seen the convergence between consumer electronics and the vehicle come together, and that's when we started to make significant investments because what we could see is the consumer desired something different, and the consumer absolutely had pent-up demand that wasn't being fulfilled. So we started making investments in a lot of different areas. We've become a very much a leading player in the, in the EV battery business. We're an overwhelming market leader in EV batteries. We absolutely believe that's the future and electrification needs to be there and are investing billions of dollars to make sure we have the capacities and the economies of scale to drive the market. Secondarily, coming out of our heritage as a consumer business, we're a leader in the infotainment space. And we think infotainment continues to be a critical part of the ecosystem going forward because it's the hub for the in and out of that data. It's that human interface that's still going to exist until we can move over to autonomy, and we think it's critically important. And we spend a lot of time and money making sure that we're well positioned there. And finally, we've recently started spending a lot of time and energy on this whole idea of smart highway. And we're not doing it from a standpoint of what we can do in the lab or what we can simulate, but we're doing it in a real live highway. We announced recently that in cooperation with the Colorado Department of Transportation, we're going to enable 90 miles from Denver into the mountains with a smart highway network that'll have VDEX technology such that you'll be able to know when others have engaged the brakes. You'll know if an airbag is deployed. You'll know if they put wipers on. You'll know traffic patterns. You'll have all that information available to you so you and the vehicle can react. We think it incredibly enhances the experience because it improves traffic and gives people back time. That I mentioned before that people really want time? This is another key factor why we think highways will get smarter because helping with traffic congestion exponentially increases the amount of time or the amount of time you don't have to spend on the highway. The last thing is autonomy, and, and we're spending a lot of money and space there, and it's absolutely going to happen, as I mentioned earlier. So then, if I just take a look at, at what I've talked about up till now, electrification, conductivity, autonomy, um, Everybody today has talked about that. We talked about it from a standpoint of consumer desire, consumer behavior, the need for speed. They need to be faster, cheaper, better, and the ability to deal with data in a way that we haven't been able to do it. But it's also a matter of dealing with the consumer as it relates to that design and really understanding consumers' desires and consumers' behavior. And we're really banking on our experiences and our history with trying to deal with consumers to really get us to where we think we need to, do, need to be going forward. And of course, what the consumer always will tell you is they want innovation. They want, to, want it in a way that's effective for them, and they want it in a way that, that, that makes a lot of sense for what they're trying to accomplish. From our standpoint, there's four enablers that really will happen in innovation. 
And these are critical not only to the consumer space or the automotive space, but in a lot of other spaces that we've seen this over and over. So we're pretty, pretty confident that the things that are really important are platforms, partnerships, personalization. And then finally, this whole idea of modularization or personalization that actually fits into the vehicle mode. So first of all, platforms. There's no question that we're moving forward on platforms. We have to move forward because the cost of investment of discrete solutions is too high today, and the time to market will be much too slow. So we absolutely need to partner with the leading people out there in order to enable these platforms to move faster than we can today because three-year, four-year, five-year life cycles are not going to be competitive moving forward, and it's not what the consumer wants. The second P is partnerships. The amount of capital the amount of time, the amount of energy that's going to take to deal with the disruptions in the market is not one that a single company is going to want to take on, so these partnerships become more important. And the best example we have of that is the Gigafactory that we've collaborated and partnered with with Tesla in, in Nevada. It's a multi-billion dollar bet that the EV market will take hold, it will take hold aggressively in the United States, and we've partnered in a very unique way with what we think is the most innovative car company in the world in order to disrupt the market. If you took a look at this factory, it's one of a kind. It's the single largest lithium ion battery factory in the world. And if you took all other lithium ion factories in the world and put it inside that factory, it would equal the amount of output. So it's a disruption from a standpoint of where we think the market's going, and it's a huge investment on what we believe will happen in the future. The other thing that I mentioned is this whole idea of mass personalization and that you get adoption rates that are much higher when you get to mass personalization. We absolutely believe that. The vehicle has to know where you're at. They have to know what the vehicle can know what you're doing, what your preferences are, how that works. And it's pretty clear that 70% of global marketers believe that they need to deliver a personalized service to have a successful future. So if that's the word from 70% of marketers, it has to apply to this industry. And we're working with any number of companies to make sure we enable that as we go forward. And then finally, pods. Maybe a little bit different than what the auto companies will tell you or what they'll talk about, but we believe that the whole idea of modularization makes sense for the consumer. And the consumer really wants more choice. And, and they want to be able to choose what that vehicle type might be, potentially what that powertrain might look like. They want to have the flexibility to deal with whatever it is, and to be able to build a vehicle to their individual specification and to be able to build it in pieces. So we believe, especially in the EV market going forward, people are going to want to buy to their preferences and their behaviors. If they drive 50 miles, why give them 600 miles worth of length? They need 50, they want 50, give them 50. If they want 200, give them 200. Modularize the vehicle such that it can scale what the consumer needs. Give them body styles that can change easily. Be able to be quick and swift, so if you make a mistake, you can correct it in a year. We absolutely believe that this is going to happen. So if you really put together electrification and autonomy, there is, what I'm saying here, is an infinite amount of possibilities, right? Autonomous is infinitely better for the, for the consumer. It's infinitely better from a standpoint of the safety of the driver. And electrification is infinitely better for the ecology. So it's better for the planet, it's better for the individuals on this planet, so there's no question that it's going to happen. The only question from our side is a matter of time and speed. So we're already in an era of connected vehicle that's already exists today, as we saw today by 2020. The adaption rate's going to be really, really high. We think it'll be approaching 100% in the US and, and close to that in other parts of the world. So connected vehicle has, to a great extent, already happened. So what comes next? the early adopters that start buying into the concept that even before I get the parity in an, an electric vehicle or I, I get an autonomous vehicle, I'll start be willing to adopt and I'm willing to pay a premium for that. But it's not mass adoption, it's early adoption. We think it quickly comes as a return on investment equation. And we think it moves for the consumer to the commercial grade and we actually think commercial applications in route delivery or last mile delivery is the first thing that makes sense for an autonomous electric vehicle. So that's going to come first because there's a very meaningful return on investment. 
And then finally, sometime after 2025, we believe the tr complete transformation happens. So from our standpoint, you know, it's all about the consumer, really what their preferences are. We, we, we've talked a little bit about what that means from that perspective. What we're really imploring the industry to really look at is how do you remake and really retransform this industry in a way that we haven't done before? To do that, we need partners like you. And I certainly have enjoyed the opportunity to talk to you today and appreciate your time and attention. Thank you.